Matthew 22. But before we get to Matthew 22, we want to go back to 21 and just plot a development of thought that happens um, that leads to the story that we find in Matthew 22. And so as we begin to do that, let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer once more. Heavenly Father, we do seek your presence and your wisdom, your guidance. We pray that you would manifest your presence before us today, that, we, that our hearts may come into communion with you. So, so bless us in this, Lord. We come to you expectantly, waitingly. This is your day, your hour, your people, and we pray for your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, so Matthew 21 begins with the triumphal entry. Now, the triumphal entry, you'll remember the story. Jesus tells his disciples to go down into the little village, find a donkey, a colt, and uh, bring it up to him, and he rides into town. And as a result of him riding into town, he was proclaiming something. He was announcing himself to be the Messiah, because in the Old Testament it was foretold that your Messiah shall come to you meek and lowly and riding on the back of a donkey. The, the uh, Pharisees were rather upset, because there was much joy, much singing, and much praise. Now... Chronologically, as far as time is concerned, how far before the crucifixion is this event of the triumphal entry? It's more or less at the beginning of that week, right? So we're into the final week leading up to the death of Jesus. Until this point, he has been very hush-hush in some ways. You know, he's healed the blind and he's made the lame to walk. And in numerous cases, he's said to them, don't tell anyone about this. Go present your, your offering to the priests. Get yourself declared cleansed or whatever the case was. And um, <clears throat> don't broadcast it. The time is not ready yet. They're... But now, as he gets to this point in his ministry, he's laying all the cards openly on the table, so to speak. And he's announcing quite publicly who he is and what he's here for. The time of his ministry is coming to fulfillment. Right, so he announces himself as Messiah. Now, in the next little snapshot here in Matthew 21, you'll find the story of the fig tree. So Jesus is on his way to the temple one day. He's hungry. And as he passes a fig tree grove, he finds one that is full of leaves. He walks up to the fig tree because if it's full of leaf, it must be full of figs. He's hungry. He gets there, he finds the tree full of figs, sorry, full of leaves, but having no figs, and he's hungry. So he curses the fig tree. Next day, as they walk past, fig tree is dead from the roots up. Wow, that's quite amazing. Because if you were to go out and speak to your grapevine or your fig tree this afternoon and say, Cursed are you, let there never be any more figs born on you or grapes or whatever, I guarantee you tomorrow it will be doing what it's always been doing. So when the disciples walk with Jesus past the fig tree the next day and find it dead, they're amazed. Why did Jesus curse the fig tree? Was he just having one of those uncontrolled fits of anger? You know, stupid fig tree. If you want to be like that, take your life away. What was the fig tree? You do not have to look at me with the sermon eyes. You can answer me. What was the fig tree? It was an object lesson. It was a parable. What was the parable teaching? Sorry? You must produce fruit. Okay, that's the general lesson we'd apply to ourselves. What was he saying to the people of his day? Who is the fig tree? The Jewish nation is the fig tree, full of leaves and promise of fruit, right? Been blessed. And he's expecting them to bring forth fruit. But while they have all the trappings and all the beauty of what he's blessed them with, when he inspects them, there is no spiritual fruit. And what was he saying to them with this object lesson? Time is running short. I expect you to bring forth fruit. And if you don't, you will lose the blessings. Right. Next snapshot. They question Jesus' authority. Moving on from there down to verse 28. Parable of the two sons. First son, both of them, both of them get told to go out and work for the father, right? The one son says, yes, yes. And then what? He doesn't go. The next son says outright, no, he rebels. 
but changes his mind and goes. What was Jesus saying to the people of his time? What do the two sons represent? What does the first son represent? The one that said yes, yes, and didn't go. Who's he? Israel. Same as the fig tree. Who is the son that said no but went? The Gentiles. What was Jesus saying? I'm not interested in lip service. I'm looking for action. And if you won't go, I will call another. Are you with me? Next snapshot, verse 33. Parable of the wicked vine dressers. A landowner releases out his land to these men who want to tend and to keep the vineyard that has been planted with the intention for the landowner of what? What does the landowner want? He wants the fruit, right? This is what they are employed to do, to cultivate the land of his planting and to bring forth fruit. So when harvest time comes, he sends his messengers. And how do they treat the messengers? With contempt, right? They abuse them and so on. He sends more messengers. They abuse and kill those. Finally, he decides to send his own flesh and blood, his son. Surely they will respect the son that has come forth from my being, right? He is one with me. And so surely the son will be respected like they ought to respect the landowner who is the father of the son. But what do they do to the son? They murder, they put to death the very son sent by the father. What was Jesus doing? What was he saying to the people of his time? He was prophesying, wasn't he? He was giving a history of the Jewish nation in that parable. The history of the prophets laid out there and the way the Jewish leaders treated those prophets. And finally, God sends his own son into the world. Born under the law, as Galatians says it, born as a Jewish man. He comes forth to the Jews. And Jesus had said to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, salvation is of the Jews. In other words, through this lineage would come the Messiah. Surely they will respect the Son. But he knew that the ones to whom he was speaking the parable were busy plotting his death as he spoke. And he was saying, I know your thoughts. I know the intentions of your heart. I know the end game. Turn. Turn from your ways. Verse 45. Now when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about who? About them. In other words, paraphrased, they got it. They heard the message loud and clear. They heard the warnings. They heard the ultimatums. They heard the pleadings. They understood that he was talking about them. But they still sought to lay hands on him. The only thing that stopped them was the fear of the crowd. Because the crowd took him to be a prophet. Imagine that, reaching a place where you're so hardened that the most direct appeals understood by the heart and the mind fall on deaf ears. Not the first time, probably not the second time, probably not the last time in earth's history that that'll happen. Right, so, Matthew 22. Matthew 21 flows into Matthew 22, and you get the message. All the way through Matthew 21, he begins by announcing the Messiahship, that he has come and his ministry is here, that, that the one they're looking for, it is him with the triumphal entry. Again and again and again, parable, lesson after lesson, saying to them, do not go through with your intentions to murder the Messiah. I know what your plans are. You have been called. You have been blessed. You have been appointed. But that appointment is not unconditional. That appointment is based on a sense of mission. If you reject the one who is the core of your mission, if you reject the very message that you are supposed to preach, then how can you be used by, as my instrument to a world to seek and to save the lost? How can you remain the chosen people if you will not receive the message that is to go forth, if you will not enter into the mission for which you've been called? If you 
you will not tend and take care of the grape fields, you know, the grape vines, if you will not be the son who obeys and goes, if you are the fig tree that looks promising but bears no fruit, how can you remain the chosen, the promised, and the blessed? And then comes Matthew 22. Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. I'm going to suggest to you right at the offset, rather than reading the whole parable and then coming back and pulling it apart, I'm going to try and do that step by step. And I'm going to suggest to you up front that Matthew 22, very similarly to verses 33 to 40 in Matthew 21, which was the parable of the vine dresses, right? Matthew 22 is the most detailed in the development of this thought pattern. His appeal to their hearts, the presentation of the gospel, his, his, his invitation for them to yet fulfill the calling to which they've been called. The message of mercy still extended, but at the same time, the warning that time is running short. I'm going to suggest to you that Matthew 22 is all of that, plus the most detailed of timelines. A chronological setting forth of the various phases of the gospel going to the world. No dates are mentioned, just broad periods of time. As Jesus in this parable rehearses with those who would understand the Jewish history. So he says, a wedding feast has been prepared. Who is it that is getting married? The son of the father. The father is the great king. And if you're paying attention, you're already beginning to track the message of the gospel, aren't you? The great king sends his son. His son is going to be married. So he invites guests to the wedding. There was an initial invitation. Notice that verse 2 says, He sent out his servants to call those who were invited. Where is? Present or past? Past tense. There was a great calling. There was a great invitation. And I will suggest to you, right up front, that the original call was made to Abraham. Abraham, the father of the Hebrew nation, called by the promise of God, reckoned as righteous because he believed the promise of God. And you'll find all this detail in Romans chapter 4. Moses, later on, 400 to 430 years later, Moses arose in the land of Egypt trained in the king's palace, the Pharaoh's palace, becomes the fulfillment to the promise made to Abraham. Moses receives the law. He's the one who brings them out of slavery. He presents to them the codes of God's ten principles of righteousness. He organizes the nation. He lays before them the righteousness of God. He is, he is the one through whom God reveals himself to Israel and organizes and fulfills practically what was promised to Abraham 400 years earlier. The original invitation given to Abraham, fulfilled by Moses, calling this people into existence. And then, after that original invitation, the ones who were invited, he sent forth his servants to call them again. The prophets of the Old Testament. All the way through the Old Testament, God sent forth His servants to call a nation already called, to call them back to obedience, back to loyalty, back to their mission, back to the gospel message. But it says in verse 3 at the end, they were not willing to come. They were not willing to come. How many times did they apostatize? How many times did they give themselves over to the gods of the Philistines or the Babylonians or whoever it was surrounding them? How many times did they go a whoring after other gods until eventually God even raises up a prophet named Hosea and says, now I want you to demonstrate this because they're not understanding the words. I want you to marry a prostitute. I want you to marry an unfaithful woman who you know is unfaithful up front. And then I want you to go and get her back every time she runs away. Every time she sells herself cheap. I want you to go and fetch her. 
Maybe this graphic, shocking lesson portrayed in real life will help them to realize. But they were not willing to come. Verse 4. So again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. Have, past, present, or future. It's, it's past brought into the future, isn't it? I've been preparing it, but now it's ready. It's present. I have prepared it. It's ready right now. Who were the messengers that went out when the supper had been prepared? John the Baptist. The son himself, Jesus. Announcing that the kingdom of heaven is no longer a future promise. The kingdom of heaven is amongst you. Is that not what Jesus said to the, to the people of his day? The kingdom of heaven has come. The kingdom of heaven is here. It will yet reach its fullest climax in the future. But the kingdom of heaven is here. Because the presence of God in Christ is the presence of the heavenly kingdom. The gospel is not some future reality. You and I from the day of Christ's birth are living in the reality of the kingdom of heaven inaugurated. It is here with us, amongst us. It was present with the Jews in their, in their day. The supper is already prepared. Come, said John the Baptist. Come, said Jesus. Come, said the apostles of the New Testament who were instructed by Jesus to start where? Preach this gospel in Jerusalem and Judea. And only after that to the ends of the world. They were living in the time of verse 4. Despite the rejection, the hereditary ongoing rejection as a general rule of the Jewish people down through the Old Testament era. Prophet after prophet which was persecuted, sword in half and done all sorts of atrocities to. Later honored by the next generation. While the next generation did the same thing to their present day prophet that the, that the previous generation had done to the prophet before them that they were now honoring. I hope you caught all of that. Still he sent more invitations. John the Baptist, the Son himself, the apostles of the New Testament. Surely they will come because it is already prepared. He says, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed. And all things are ready. Come to the wedding. Interestingly enough, those are sacrificial animals. Right? The wedding is prepared. The sacrifice is is made. Come. Come now. It's a present day reality. Come now. How would they react? Verse 5. But they made light of it, went their ways, one to his own farm and another to his business. Verse 6. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. Verses 5 and 6 paint in broad strokes two subgroups of the one group that rejects the gospel. There are some who will reject the gospel just because they are distracted with the things of this life. Verse 5. They were just indifferent. They went on with their life. They couldn't care less. They were just busy with what they needed to do today to get by or get rich or whatever it was that their goals, their eyes and their hearts were set on down here. They were just indifferent to the message. We were invited, but we don't have time. It would be nice, but we don't have time. Yes, we would like to go, but you know what? There's more pressing and urgent things than a celebration with the king. Then there was another group. There was another group who were not merely indifferent, but they vehemently opposed the invitation. They had their minds and their hearts set on not only ignoring it themselves, but they were going to do their best to prevent the invitation from going forward. And they took those servants and they murdered them. This represents that class who are actively engaged to prevent the gospel going forward. They're not just too busy to care. They are going to do everything they can to malign the servants of God. Everything they can to break down the reputation, even kill if they must. They will do what it takes to stop the gospel message from going forward. They're not merely indifferent. They are active to prevent and to stop the spread of the invitation. 
They not only don't want, they're not just that they don't want to go in themselves, they themselves want to make sure that this thing stops and no one else goes in. I ask you today, are you either of those two groups? And I pray to God you're not. I certainly know that none of you here are in that last group. Because I'm still alive. But it is possible for the church to be filled with the former group. Hey, wait a second, here's a question for you. <laughs> Who was this parable about? Was this parable about the Gentiles, the unbelievers? Was this parable about the Roman authorities? Who was this parable about? No, who was this parable about in the time of Christ? The church of Christ's day. And by extension, Ian might be right. But in the time of Christ, who was Christ addressing with this parable? The religious people. The church folks. Not the irreligious. Not the heathens. Not the pagans out there. His people. His people. Take note of that fact. Isn't this amazing? Because that makes sense to us for those people who are out there. There are people out there who are indifferent. There are people out there who would oppose the message. Surely this could never be true of the church. And yet this parable was given to the church. Verse 7. When the king heard about it, he was furious. He sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Chronologically, if you're following the pattern that we're laying out here, what might that, what event might that refer to? AD 70, right? When not only spiritually had the Jews passed their sell by date, but physically as well, they reap the consequences of rejecting the protecting mercy of God. Verse 8, then he said to his servants, as many as you find, sorry, he said to his servants, verse 8, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. What's the next stage of the unfolding of the gospel message? What is this referring to? Which invitation is this? The invitation to? To the Gentiles. When the Jews began persecuting the church of the early days, after the gospel had been proclaimed in Jerusalem and Judea, the persecution that was started by none other than Saul and his friends, Saul who later becomes Paul and is converted, all that, but that per initial persecution that begins there drives the, the Christian concentration of believers out of Jerusalem and they go to all the rest of the world. And they take with them the gospel message. And now it is no longer the Jewish nation which is doing the calling because the Jewish nation doesn't have a message to call with. But the Christian church founded on the proclamation of Peter that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God. That proclamation goes forth in the form of that early Christian church and people are converted to the gospel message of Jesus Christ. The good, the bad, the ugly are called into the kingdom, kingdom of God. That's what it says, right? At the end of verse 10. The wedding hall was filled with guests. And before that, both bad and good. So what is the wedding hall? Is the wedding hall the coming of Jesus? Yes or no? Is the wedding hall the coming of Jesus? Is it heaven? Union of Christ with his people. I'd suggest to you that the wedding hall cannot be 
the future kingdom. Why? Who's there? Both the good and the bad. This is akin to that parable that Jesus told where they went out fishing with a dragnet and the dragnet caught both good and bad. And what was that a symbol of? What's fishing a symbol of? I will make you fishers of men. And so they throw the net out there and the net catches good and bad. In other words, some, some become a member of the kingdom of heaven, not always with the right intentions or the right meaning or the right understanding. They are joined to God's people. They're along for the ride. But they're not converted of heart. The net catches both good and bad. The kingdom hall is filled with both good and bad. The kingdom hall is the church of God down here, planet earth. The message goes to the Gentiles. The church is established. The message finds appeal with both good and bad. People join for all sorts of reasons. And you find problems in the church and you find problems outside of the church. And the church is not a perfect place. Of course that excludes this congregation, right? Everything that happens here is always according to the will of God, right? That would be nice. But unfortunately, is not the case. The good and the bad are invited non-discriminately. Everybody who comes in to the kingdom of God, perhaps everybody who comes in has a bit of good and bad too. The message goes to the Gentiles and the early church is filled with both good and bad. Are you with me? And so it will be until the end. So when you get discouraged and you look around you and you realize that stuff happens that shouldn't happen, realize that Jesus acknowledged that. It was, doesn't mean it's cool, doesn't mean it's okay, but Jesus himself acknowledged that it would be like that until the end. The wedding hall, the age of the gospel has come, the sacrifice has been made. We are called to the celebration of the king with his people and everybody who comes in, comes in with both good and bad in them. And manifest some of that good and bad right through to the very end. And when you get upset by the bad you see in another, remember that there might still be a bit of bad left in you. The wedding hall is filled with both good and bad. Then it says, verse 11, The king came in to see the guests. And when he did so, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. Now, up until this point, no mention has been made of this. The culture of the day is assumed. So it went something like this. A king who is very rich pays for the wedding feast for his son, right? Whose responsibility is it to house the guests? Whose responsibility is it to feed the guests? At whose expense is all of this done? The king's, right? Whose responsibility in the culture of the day was it to clothe the guests, the king. The king fed them, the king housed them, the king clothed them, and the king fitted the bill for it all. Do you see the gospel in that? Do you see the gospel in that? Whose initiative was it to send out the invitation? The king's. Why did the king send out the invitation? He wanted the privilege of the company of those whom he invited. He was interested in the company of his guests. He could have celebrated himself. He could have celebrated with those who were his. But he sends the invitation to those that he wants to celebrate with him. He says, I will fit the bill for it all. I will pay for what you have to wear. I will pay for your food. I will pay for the celebration itself. Your part is simply to receive the invitation in good faith and to come forward and to join me as we celebrate together. I'm not asking you to pay for anything. I'm not asking you to bring anything. I'm not asking you to do anything except choose to accept the invitation and show up on the day. The rest will be done by me so that there is no excuse for anything anyone to not come. You can't say, well, I really don't have appropriate clothing for the occasion. I really don't have the food budget to cover my travel expenses or to cover my stay while I'm there. I don't know how I'm going to put myself up. The king says, I will do it all. All I want is your company. I'm begging you to come and enjoy the event with me. 
I will sponsor the whole thing. All I want you to do is come. Just come. Choose to accept the invitation. Come. So the king comes in. He moves amongst his church. He inspects the garments that they are wearing. And all he wants to do, all he wants to see is one thing. And what is that? Whether they are wearing what the king has provided. Is this a picture of the ultimate and final judgment? No. It's a picture of what comes before that. The ultimate and final judgment comes a little bit later on when it says, He said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? The man was speechless. Which incidentally in the Greek means he was muzzled. You know when you take a dog or a cow or a whatever that's...